can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. This is part of the Top Agency series. I have Sammy Davis. Um, he runs GoToTheWell.ca. You can check it out. But before I formally introduce you, Sammy, he's got a, a very long history in the agency business. Um, so it's going to be interesting to hear the evolution and the lessons learned. Um, but I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. Um, there's one I did with Adi Clevett, who she actually runs an agency. She helps companies um, create SOPs for their business, all right? Uh, the non-sexy thing that makes operations run smoothly. And we de- geeked out on the software and tools that allow us to be more productive. So we just shared everything that we like to use from like a tech stack perspective. So Sam, we'll hear you've been in this agency world a lot. What, you know, your tech stack, uh, what you like. Um, There's another one I did with Todd Tasky, who um, he runs the Second Bite podcast. So he helps pair private equity to an agency to help sell them. And sometimes people make more on the second bite than the first when that private equity keeps buying, you know, um, buying companies into their that portfolio and then sells that portfolio. Um, and he talks about valuations and mergers and acquisitions and everything like that. That was a super interesting episode. Um, and this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. At Rise 25, uh, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the strategy, the accountability, and the full execution. You know, Sam, we call ourselves the magic L's that work in the background to make sure it looks easy for the host and the company and they could just focus on their business and having the conversation. You know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. And so if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com to learn more or email support at rise25.com. And I'm excited to have this conversation with Sammy Davis. He founded GoToTheWell.ca in 2014. And Go to the Well is a human-centered marketplace for marketing, advertising, communications, and technology, and accounting. Um, they are, I guess we describe it, Sammy, as part agency, part matchmaker, and they help forge marketing, advertising, communication, and technology relationships for businesses. And they're really a human-driven marketplace. So they provide clients with support and advice while recommending the best individuals and teams to tackle each job. Um, And by the way, it's free to sign up without an obligation. So it's pretty cool. And he's got his past and history as, as a former ad executive. He is a seasoned entrepreneur, business consultant. And I know this comes from your experience, Sammy, where late in your ad agency career, you kind of started to recognize and document that corporate marketing and technology teams and needs and their expectations of vendors started to change. So thanks for joining me. No, thank you for the invite. This is awesome. So just start off and and tell people a little bit, I I described it a little bit, but what um, go to the well.ca is. And if you go to the site, you can go, you know, it's the, the well, you know, creative consultant. So talk about what, what you do. So it is a it's a human centered marketplace. Um, one of the best ways to sum it up is, um, you know, if you think about uh, celebrities and their agents, well, the celebrities in this case are the the talents and specialists that we go and we curate and we scout and we bring onto the roster. And the roster itself is actually in two se- split into two separate categories that reflects the actual way that people work now. Um, so we, we bring people in, we take them through a vetting system that's proprietary, entirely our own, and it falls outside the kind of traditional norms of, uh, any kind of FTE hiring or full-time employment. Um, and it falls outside the norms, quite honestly, of, uh, uh, traditional recruitment as well. Um, so we fall outside this recruitment bucket. We fall outside of that 
Also, I'm going to call it traditional, even though it hasn't been around as long, but that traditional marketplace that is entirely technology driven. Um, the human centered is a very important piece to the whole puzzle um, because unlike say a traditional recruiter, we're not just sitting on a database. Uh, we go out, we start to curate, we start to bring in people based on referral, based on knowledge of what we know they've accomplished and seek them out and bring them into the roster. Um, and then we try to match them up with scenarios that best suit them and the clients so that both reap success. And that in it, that requires in our experience, a human touch and some human guts and uh, understanding of what's not being said, where a lot of the technology leanings can only do what the keywords will let you do. So um, so that's that's in a nutshell what the premise is. That human-centered driver is a big important piece to us. And you mentioned that we do it all for free. We do indeed. Our whole, um, uh, our whole reason for existence is that connection. And we want to understand. Um, one of the criticisms I had when I first started the company was that anything in the freelance marketplace arena um, was developed with this idea that the person making the order knew what to order. Um, and in marketing, especially, the entire industry is built on buzzwords that are constantly evolving rapidly and at different paces in some cases. Uh, and next thing you know, um, the case in point, the, the case I usually use to explain this is, um, you know, if you were to type in the keyword, I need a brand done, well, you could get anything back. Uh, you can get people trying to make logos, people trying to make positional documents, people combining them all, building stories. It could be anywhere from 900 bucks to $50,000 exercise. And it was because the order allowed you to order a brand. Um, what we do is we work with the clients to actually figure out what it is they need to accomplish, which sounds pretty easy, but it, that's the hard part. Um, and then we start making recommendations on best practices we've seen, what's the best way to tackle it, not just who, but how. So for this, Sammy, there's no upfront fee for the company. Nope. Um, but then if they hire and when they hire that team under go to the well, then the company gets paid. Yep. So the way that we've done it, we've, we, as you mentioned, my, my upbringing, my professional upbringing was mostly in the agency world. So I, I was listening. That's how I started the company as I was listening and watching what the, the um, corporate marketing teams were asking. And it, it, in that time, it was a lot of wish lists. It was, I really wish I could work directly with so-and-so and not have to have an account manager in there. Or I really wish that I love my account manager and I really wish they wouldn't change jobs every two years because now I'm or every 18 months or whatever, it, whatever it was on, you know, now I've got to make switches um, and rethink if that's the agency I want to work with. Um, so I, I, I really took that to heart uh, in building the pr initial parameters around what this all has to do with. And one of the key components here is. We've kept the idea that that organization, that centralization of the administrative side is still there. So if you're working with us, and I mentioned we have two categories, a project freelancer is much different and finds success in much different ways than a fractional contractor. Um, and the environments in those success are completely different. So we'll never let a client make a mistake of trying to bring a project person into a fractional engagement or vice versa. Um, we'll always guard that recommendation and make sure they're picking the right folks out of the right banners. But we have clients that do both. Um, so no matter what, if you're working with one person or a dozen or a team and a couple of fractional and a couple of project folks, you still only get one invoice per month. Um, so part of the problem in the freelance world at that time, and it still is, when you start working with freelancers and you're any, you know, you're a larger company, you got procurement practices, you've got things that all need to match. Next thing you know, you start working with the freelance and they're pounding out invoices and saying, pay me tomorrow, or they forget. <laughs> and you're, you're, you're getting an invoice a quarter later and going, oh, my, my, my AP has told me that that's already closed. Uh, what am I going to do with this? So it, we take all that out um, and make sure that uh, those good pieces are still left in there. 
I think um, one thing that's instructive to me in this process, and it could be for any company, an agency or or anyone, is what you were saying. You were recognizing these pain points, right? For yeah. any business, like you, you know, businesses solve problems essentially exactly. for yeah. customers. So, and you were saying you kind of I like the phrase you use, which is like wish list. Like these companies had a wish list. It's really their pain points. What were some of those? Can you repeat a couple of them? And like, what were other things you were seeing and recognizing um, as, as pain points for these companies? For sure, yeah. In the in, in, the initial pain points were things like the searching. Um, I need someone to do X, Y, Z. If they came up to, I need someone and not just a company. So you know, now you've got someone on your team who's you're paying to do one task, and now they're running around trying to find somebody. Um, that whole piece was a problem. Um, so that's where kind of the roster mentality came from. But primarily, one of the things that was seeping into the the uh, the in- industry as a whole was the idea of billable hours was taking over the some of the the requirements of what a job actually looked like. So by that, I mean, you know, when uh, I was observing and hearing from my own clients at the time when I was managing the agency that, you know, it's a problem to call you every time because I know it's got to go through six different people until I get my output. So it's slower, it's more expensive, and I don't have the controls that I'm looking for. Um, there was an expression at the time that people really, and it's it it's happening today. Now it's commonplace. There's a desire to say, hey, if that designer is working on this, I want to work with that designer directly. I don't need a PM and two other people in the middle uh, to make sure that, that you know, and then we start translating feedback and next thing you know, it's sideways again. And you're asking me to pay for it, for it to have gone sideways. Um so those were some of the the main trigger points. Um, then some of the trigger points that that came out in that too, it wasn't just corporate clients. It was agencies themselves were going, hey, you know, when I start working with a freelancer, I need that freelancer to build a relationship with me, not just one and done, get in and out. Um, you know, they were making mistakes at the time of taking people that onto freelance jobs that were in between jobs. And part of our vetting process is we don't permit someone to come in when they're in between jobs. That's not what our company's about. We don't take all freelancers. We vet them out where we're, our roster access is very guarded because um, we need to be able to honor guarantees. I gave the example earlier about, you know, when I first started the company, people hadn't seen this kind of approach before and said, uh, well, you know, one of my primary problems is I feel like, and this was a constant, I feel like I just trained up my account manager or my strategist on the agency side. And when I get them there, they move to another one. So I just lost all that investment time. And now I'm challenged with, do I follow them to their new agency or do I continue the contract with the existing agency? When I first brought the well to folks, there hadn't really been a concept of this purpose-driven gig worker that is building a career and a business around this. And so I was constantly challenged with this idea of, you know, how do I guarantee that person is not just going to do their thing and then I'll never hear from them again? Um, How do I train someone up and get to love them? And then all of a sudden they're in a full-time job somewhere. And that's part of what informed our differentiation in the categories. So our project side, you see it on our website, our project side, you can't even get considered for the project side of any of our rosters, unless you've been in business for yourself as your nine to five for three plus years minimum. It means you're running a business. It means you have all of your business pieces in play. And so that was a defining shift is, you know, uh, um, I mentioned when we were talking earlier that we, we constantly got categorized into, well, you're this in-between thing, right? You're like not an agency and you're not a marketplace and you're not a recruiter, but what are you? Um, and one of the shifts is that we actually are representing small, solo, um, you know, sole proprietorship businesses, not individuals. We don't see them as individuals. We see them as businesses. A dual-sided so marketplace we- is difficult. You know, there's clients and then there's talent. Yeah. Um, 
are the and I know you're you're Canadian based. Um, are the talent sources from all over, or where where the talent tends to be? Very important to us that it was all localized remote. So by that, I mean, it's a, it's a funny little term and I'm always accused of making up my own funny terms. I can't help myself. I came out of the marketing world, right? Um, the uh, localized remote to us reflects that if somebody in Toronto needs a designer, their first choices are going to be the people in Toronto. There's nobody in our roster that doesn't call um, uh, Canada home or North America home. Um, we don't have any overseas. We're not a, we're not a, a, um, we're not first and foremost, a kind of commoditization of skills to be able to race to the bottom financially. Um, we actually do the other side of the swing. Uh, we defend the, we don't even talk about it as living wages. We defend the idea that people can have a very healthy business in doing this kind of work for themselves. So we ensure that they get paid what they should be paid. Um, we we educate our, our roster all the time on here's what the kind of uh, uh, financial constraints are. Uh, here's what keeps you competitive. So, you know, um, there are people in our roster that are way more expensive than you might be ready to deal with. There's people in our roster that are way under what you might have expected. And there's people that are right in that middle. We've got the whole thing, but what we do is we leave it all up to them. It's not a, I'm going to do this at night when I have no, when I'm watching TV and bang out something for 20 extra dollars. This is their career. They are full specialist. It's a specialist economy that we've been kind of wrapping our hand, wrapping ourselves around um, since we started in 2014. So I can see how you can attract talent and vet them you know yep. with you know we have pro potential projects do you want you know and you vet them how do you get the other side of the marketplace the clients coming in for the talent uh a it's you know what it's a lot of um outbound meaningful genuine conversations quite frankly a lot like you and i are doing right now um you know the business that we're in is is as evolved since our 2014, you know, jump off. Um, and you know, in 2014, talking to people about remote being not in your office necessarily uh, was a very different conversation than it is now, um, right? And and COVID was one of those times that did a service for our business. It showed everybody that everything we've been preaching up until that point was applicable, and now it had to be actioned. Um, so that, that evolution has changed some of the pieces that we started with as foundation there. So, um, there's not a single company that we work with right now, or that exists out there right now that hasn't at least recognized the impact that professional gig labor can have on their entire human and capital strategy and are looking at Where's the benefits? Where are the risks? And how do I build around that to take advantage of things like budgetary fluidity, um, ensuring that when I need to scale up or down, I have the ability to do that quickly. I'm getting, you know, I'm getting qualified individuals right away. And I'm getting that word of mouth referral that's saying, hey, you can trust them because I trust them. And here's all the reasons why. Um, a lot of what we're, you know, there's there's people. It's a huge industry. So the professional gig labor force right now in can, in in North America is the, considered the fastest growing labor force in all of North America, um, and that is sole proprietors going making that transition from I'm no longer an employee, you know, a business owner that does contracts in one of these forms. Um, you're seeing a growth now. I mean, and and the growth is being measured by lenders. So you can trust that some of this research is not just, you know, hey, the people like Sammy are, are, uh, are, are asking for the research and then look, it benefits their company. Isn't that the way it goes? It's things like Visa and MasterCard and such are, are actually out there going, there's an increase in sole proprietors. We, they have different lending principles. We have to lend, learn to lend to these people differently. And if that's where a bunch of our, our uh, workforce is going, we need to figure some things out. So in some of those statistics, I can tell you 
that in 2020, it was estimated that 36% of, of full-time positions were being replaced by contractors in the kind of corporate world. It's estimated that by 2027, you're going to see that shift over to 52%, which presents challenges to every aspect of a business um, from management principles and values, right? We're seeing a shift in, um, you know, the good managers, the good principled companies are no longer going, hey, I value seeing you do your work for 40 hours a week versus I value you giving me the thing you said you were going to give me when you said you were going to give it to me. <laughs> you know, it's it's an output value now. So there's all these changes that are happening there. And then on the HR side, you're presented with this idea of like, okay, so everything I'm doing on full-time employment recruitment um, now presents me risks when I go after a, a contractor. Um, and that is a very expensive challenge because you're talking about changes in policies and procedures that can also hurt you on the other end when you're starting to recruit or let people go. Um, so it's a fascinating market right now. Um, and so these are the kind of conversations we're just reaching out, asking people what they're doing and if they need help um, to, as I mentioned before, make sure that uh, they're not paying their staff to just kind of hunt around for people in hopes that they can get something together. Um, you know, we take care of things like making sure your IP is not in danger if you're working with somebody. Uh, we, we Security is a big piece to what we bring to the table. Um, also, the assurance that, you know, uh, uh, if you start bringing in on your own, we've, we just finished our own research study, which, you know, again, serves to help us. But uh, I look at it and say, there's a reality in there, you know, 90% of the HR managers we talked to expressed that they were, uh, they had such high fail rates every time they were left out to their own devices to go out and get contractors. Um, those fail rates meant that you know, if they started a project, those people were leaving before the project was done, or those people were were not seeing their full contract to the end. And a lot of that has to do with the process and strategies that they're using that are FTE to basically try to bring in somebody. I use the example all the time. If you get it, if you're putting out on a con uh, on a on a hiring job board that you need a contractor, and they fire your resume, you shouldn't be looking at that as a victory. You should be running away from that person. Um, because if they have a resume, what they're really telling you is they're looking for a full-time job. So if you hire them on a contract basis, you're risking, you're, you're, you're exponentially higher risk of them taking off if someone weighs a full-time job at them. Does it happen, let's say someone wants, uh, I mean, I was looking at your site, um, there's, there's people who do project management. Yep. And you have them come in. And like people are really, they love working with this person. Can they bring them on for longer and longer hours and even possibly for more of a full time, not necessarily position because they're working through, uh, you know, go to the well, but if they want a larger amount of hours, does oh, that yeah. happen? Happens all the time. Um, we've seen, we've seen what used to be full-time employment engagements um, do exactly that. They'll re-audition somebody in, um, to, you know, take care of a, a specific need and then just start mounting the hours up. Um, you know, we've got a few folks I know that kind of do 40 hours a week with one company and that's, that's what they're good with. But the difference is they'll do 40 hours a week for one company, but there's an on and off switch. So, and that's at the company's behest. It's an agreement between both parties. It's not one or the other. So we see it all the time that companies are using it as a means to, again, gain that budgetary fluidity. So let's say you have a hundred thousand dollar a year job in a, for a, a creative director, which is low, but that, you know, it's a junior creative director, let's say a hundred thousand dollar a year job. When you compare hour to hour and you bring in a, a contractor, um, you're not going to get a 50% savings or like, or say, Hey, they got to match that hundred K you're going to pay more per hour, but you're also not paying for their downtime. So you're only paying them when they're engaged and if they're sitting on their thumbs, there's nothing to be paid for. Um, what we're seeing a lot happen now is they go, cool. 
we're going to hang on to that person for six months or 40 hours a week. But we know this is our downtime, so we don't need them for three of those months. Right? So you're no longer looking at 100%, you know, full-time, full-time. You're looking at full-time hours, but not at a full-time engagement. So that person will leave for three months and we'll say, find them another contract for three months with a different company altogether with the whole idea that, yeah, we'll return to the other one when they're ready. Um, and that's kind of the move that's happening. There's a lot of companies that are recognizing without anybody like me telling them that you're, you're the idea of outside influence gives you a competitive advantage over people that are not allowing outside influence, especially into marketing practices. And the only ways you get outside influence is if you allow them to leave <laughs> and then come back at a contractual level. Um, I, I We have a few folks I can cite right away that, uh, you know, they have six clients. And for the last three years, they've been revolved around those six clients in kind of three month brackets, three months here, three months here, three months off, three months of you know, kind of in and out with this company and then back to this one. Um, so it's it's the way people are rebuilding, you know, their career paths. What is an ideal from the, the client perspective coming in to look for talent? What is a, usually um, an ideal size or how would you describe that ideal client that comes to you? This, so going back to one of your questions about what was on the wish list, um, the answer is in that wish list. I, when I initially built the company, I built it to answer the question of, um, and, and any of my former account managers watching this would say, oh yeah, he's right. I drove them crazy because I would sit them down and go, I do not understand why someone's working with us because our cost, our, our cost requires that they are this high always. Every time they call us, it's minimum $100 an hour. Like what's happening? Not some small businesses can't access us. What we've done is made that access point based on the individuals within the roster themselves. So we have folks that, you know, have a volume play. They're production designers, let's say, or production writers that just bang out tons of stuff for small businesses. And that's how they built their, their business is volume, 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 um, and quick, quick hits. Um, the well was constructed with purpose to say, hey, we'll up and down the scale based on our roster. So we'll never send you somebody that is, say, a creative uh, director that requires a $200,000 budget minimum if you're a mom and pop pizza shop that needs a flyer done. Um, and that was the mismatch that I was seeing happen at my own agencies all the time. Like we had what we had. And if you were a small company and you came in and you said, I want this, I could, I could try, but I ultimately had to repackage it and send it back to you as something we could do. And we built the roster with purpose to say, Hey, the mom and pop pizza shop. Yeah, we'll help you. Right. Uh, Umbra will help you too. You know, <laughs> it, or, or, you know, major manufacturer X will help you too. Um, and, and it's because we broke it down to that individual level. I want to talk about niching and your thoughts on niching for an agency. But, sure. and I, you know, we'll talk about the, the conversation about expanding services, right? Which is sure. part of niching, right? So when we're talking about like, how do you decide? That, okay, we're going to now um, start offering uh, accounting-related services. Right. Because you could stick to what you're already doing and just go deep on that, but you're seeing something. So talk about your thoughts around niching, and then we can talk about, you know, expansion of services. Sure. Um Hundred percent. Then, the niching is a fundamental pillar to what the well is and does. Um, you know, in the shift of our of our uh, uh, the way that human capital is working and the and, and labor forces are working right now on the professional level, um, generalists are the ones that are typically rocking out full time employment. Um, specialists are the ones that have picked that niche, and you know they might be amazing at two to three things. That's you're not going to ask them to do the 70 things that you want to. <laughs> um, and therein lies our opportunity. Um, 
I mean, to jump ahead to why we moved to accounting, there was a natural evolution. Um, and it's because our niche, as much as our niche was always looked at as your marketing, advertising, comms, technology, and that's because of my background and because of my founding partners' backgrounds, we all come out of that world. Um, the thing that struck us and part of the research we started doing when we started to dig deeper into kind of the ecosystem that is a corporation and realizing all of these things that play on management values and HR policies and what have you, we realized that um, the HR task of accessing these different labor forces presented the conundrum of they don't know what they don't know. So before jumping off, we researched the heck out of it, went and figured out, you know, is there something at play here where we can be of help? And then realized that one of the when we talk about um, the growing labor force uh, in terms of gig, uh, professional gig uh, labor force, the areas that are growing the fastest in that labor force are, are things like marketing and communications. Accounting is a close second. Um, so there's a there's a supply and demand issue there um, because tradition is still telling a lot of businesses, hey, I have to have a certain amount of full time people there. Um, when in fact, we use something like the CFO, we always have we use the CFO, the CFO was the very first professional service that it became um, kind of commonplace to have that as a fractional person, not a full time person. And we use that as a measuring stick on the health of the market for us. Um, so we figured we're using the measuring stick. We've perfected this IP. I mean, when you look at that 90% fail rate that is happening when HR managers are left to their own devices to go and bring in, find, and work with, and sign agreements with contractors, and they're failing to, to not have them finish our fail rate as a company is 2%. So that showed us that, okay, we've got a, <laughs> we've got something here. And so additional research testing in the market, the result was we were able to take our, um, our uh, vetting process and discover that that fundamentally, apart from any technology, our vetting process is our IP. Um, and we have 22 standard points that need to be met and they're not as simple as question and answer, question and answer. They're not, they're not straight lines. Um, and we realize that there are six fundamentals within our vetting process that can be twisted and changed per industry. So what you're seeing in the accounting side was initially a test, and then it showed this works. This works. We're getting the same results. We're getting, you know, we we have something to compare it to with the marketing. We're getting the same results on the on the accounting. So let's go all in. I was talking about this recently with a colleague, actually earlier this afternoon, um, on the fact that um, a lot of the feeders for the growth in the professional gig marketplace, or for, sorry, the professional gig labor force, the primary feeder is any industry that includes within its within its confines a uh, a a um, a firm approach. So marketing, obviously there's, there's marketing firms there. We're seeing accounting firms um, because ultimately people learn a ton while working with an accounting firm. And, you know, anytime they are downsized or leave on their own, they're always looking at, I can do this. I can do this without the firm. So it's a feeder to that first dip. And what our vetting does is go, you're not going to get any first dippers, so they're not going to run away on you. <laughs> um, Sammy, talk about that, you know, company listening and they're like, yeah, I need a better vetting process when I'm hiring. What are some things that you'd recommend companies to, to do? A few of the things that, that you do that they should incorporate into their, their hiring. Well, the very first thing I do, and I, I do, um, I do engagements with business cohorts. And I usually shock them with the first thing out of my mouth is to say, I want everyone, if there's nothing else you get out of this, I want everyone to leave here with a mandate to abolish the word hire out of your corporate vocabulary. That's step one. Um, 
The reason for that is when you when when you're sitting around at the boardroom table and people say, "Oh, we should hire this," it sets into motion a formula that, quite frankly, just isn't working. I mean, if it was, I wouldn't exist. I wouldn't have people coming to me all the time, going, "I can't get good candidates. I can't find a source. I can't. I can't. I can't." So, step one: get rid of the word "hire." As soon as you do that, you're opened up to going. All right, now I need to start recognizing and segmenting what the different labor forces are that are prevalent out there and how do I access them and meet them not just on their terms but on equal terms. Because that's what the that's what the modern worker wants is equal term meeting. Right? It's not I owe myself to that company for giving me a job anymore. That's 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 our parents and grandparents. That was one of the values in their world of you got a job and that company was good to me. So I'll be good to them. Well, good to me is redefined now. You also got to recognize that you got, um, you know, this is always up for debate. The number is, but you know, you got at least six different generations in the workforce right now and their values are completely different from one another. Um, so one size fits all approach to any type of recruitment or human capital strategy is a terrible approach. You're setting yourself up for a fail. Um, you know, if you are going down the FTE side, that segmentation helps a ton there. Um, so if you are full-time looking for a full-time employment engagement, uh, or so you're looking for a full-time employee for this role that you have as a company, um, you got to realize who you're talking to and who you're working with. Um, you know, just imposing your hiring practice and making it crazy long and full of what you used to consider risk assessments are actually just telling people, I don't want you. Um, or I'm not doing my research on who you are. I haven't figured out anything about you. Um, I want you to tell me, and then I'm going to take forever to get back to you and then ask you for three more interviews and a PowerPoint presentation only to tell you someone else was better. People are tired of that. They're just not doing it. Um, which is why you see people jumping into the into the uh, the gig labor force going, it's on my terms now. I'm going to tell people what I want to do and what I don't. Um, your bottom, like your bottom three, bad bad terminology, but your your youngest three generations that are in the workforce, I, a fundamental recognition, whether you want to, as a company, go through with the segmentation exercise or not, recognize that the younger the person is that you're talking to, the more likely is they're no longer asking that question we used to ask when we were growing up of what do I want to be when I grow up? They're asking, why do I want to do any of it when I grow up? The question of work as a value and as a thing that we must do is legitimately being questioned by them. You've got so much research that's saying that the younger generations have already, before they even got into the workforce, have resigned themselves to the fact that they'll probably never own anything. They won't own a house. They won't own a car. And why would I want to? Um, that's a boat anchor, right? It's not. They'll use know, Uber and Airbnb. They'll just. Well, I mean, I, a lot of HR managers, especially in Canada, are shocked when I show them like, you know what? You know what's valuable to them is experience. They spent all their money on experiences. Um, it's not spending money on flashy things. Now, there's differences between the American the, the American culture in that and the Canadian culture in that, and then state to state, province to province is different too. But it's definitely skewed this direction of, you know, you're talking to somebody that values money and the idea of work totally differently than you did in your own generation. So as an HR manager looking to bring in somebody, Stop just over preparing on this idea that they're going to negotiate with you on salary and benefit packages because half of the young kids aren't even doing that. They're just going on Glassdoor and going, this is what you owe me. So make it that. That's the end of the conversation. Now, what I do want to talk to you about is how often do you need to be in the office? And could I work three months in Costa Rica? And do I need to, could, you know, do I need to check in with you when I want to take vacations or is it something that I can kind of be open to and what kind of influence am I going to have or not influence so much as impact? Am I going to be of actual value? It used to be just a thing you would see pop up in strategic planning, but now there's legitimate values and measurements tied to it by the worker themselves. Am I giving you value? Because if I'm not, that's when they start looking that whole quiet quitting trend that people are writing about is a fundamentally where a lot of that started. 
you know, uh, it's such an interesting perspective, Sam. I so I sh- appreciate you sharing it. Um, I have a few. I want to hear. Um, you, you mentioned tech stack. You know, yes. you've probably seen a lot of softwares and tools and things. So I'm wondering what you're seeing um, and what you use. And then I want to talk about mentors too in the industry. You've been in this agency space for a long time, um, but start with tech stack. What are yeah, some things I you mean- like? Uh, we, the, the, the tech stacks that I like are the ones that are actually supportive and not dictating to me what I need to do next. I have, I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, we're breaking out the, the we're breaking out our um, philosophies and our approaches on things. So we use, we use, we minimize the use of automation platforms. I will say that. And I know that flies in the face of what everybody talks about right now. Um, And we do it because we need to maintain that genuine connection. We're human-centered, technology-supported, not technology-centered, human-supported. It might be looked at as an old-school thing, but the results speak for themselves, right? Our relationships with our clients and with our um, roster members is completely the opposite of transactional there is it's not transactional it is it is reliance with each other and and trust is forged and built that way so a lot of the automation tools that are out there uh things like like you know your hubspots your par dots things like that we will make use of in different ways we'll bend them to the way that we want to work with and we'll never just set something on automatic pilot um I'll share with you something funny that I haven't been sharing with too many people, but right now, um, you know, my, my own personal kind of, uh, uh, consulting interest is always on that, um, revenue officer. I'm always building revenue with, with clients and showing new ways to do that. Um, if you go on LinkedIn right now, the thing is just drowning with, you know, CRO and sales gurus that are just firing playbooks at you. Like you wouldn't believe um, and the the advent and the leaning on AI as now a massive mass is, is turned into a massive noisemaker, to be quite honest. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed how many LinkedIn messages you get that are just pitches right off. And the whole thing's transactional. It's it's a ratio game at this point. How many people am I gonna hook? How many am I not? Um we actually my, my team was saying the other day, they were like, we love that we get the opportunity to be very custom and show people that we actually know or try to figure out who they were before we sat down for our first conversation. Um, and right now I do a thing called, uh, I call it um, uh, spam roulette, where I every Friday I pick one of those playbook automation emails that are so obvious because they all, they don't see each other. So they don't know they're all the same. Um, and uh, And I respond to one uh, and just kind of, give them pointers on how they should change the way that they're kind kind of approaching all that stuff. Um, we don't use AI for our content and, um, but we will use AI uh, to help us with things like there's a couple of neat tools that are out there um, and um, some that are kind of in their, you know, very early stages on um, just kind of rating best areas for content seeding rather than providing the content. They'll provide us avenues of here's the best spots to put that. Um, Again, um, we'll use AI for ideas around what we should be saying, but we won't ever just lift it and use it. Um, And in fact, we use our own roster to help us build out what to say based on some of the ideas that we've been able to put together that way. So, um, and that's, that's kind of a very high use of, of AI that we figured out is it's, it's a great blue sky person to listen to your yammer on about whatever and uh, spill you back things that probably aren't the idea, but there's a trigger in there. So um, it's, 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 those are our, are our text acts. We've, made sure that um you know we do uh, we do use chat bots but our chat bots are actually built to interrupt and they interrupt us as the employees to tell us someone's in there so we jump in as soon as possible we don't let the chat bot do anything recommendation wise um none of that kind of stuff so 
it, it truly is a, we're, we're very true to our claim and our brand of, you know, we're human centered tech supported and not the other way around. Um, you mentioned um, CRM and again, like not from like automation, but just like a more organization perspective. What do you like, or what have you seen people use for like a CRM or project management tools? I mean, I find that um, I find that every CRM requires a matching to the sales process and what the sales value is. Are you a relationship builder? Are you a a strict outbound chaser? Are you all built on new business or what have you? And that'll determine a lot of that. You know, uh, a great. Uh, I mean, I love um, personally. I love some of the HubSpot tools in doing the relationship build. Um, I like some of the Salesforce tools better on the new business hunt. Um, I really don't like a lot of the Salesforce relationship tool. I find it's not built for that. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, then you've got your other pieces. I will say I kind of, Rightly or wrongly, I kind of like uh, give the big red X to, I don't even know what it's called, but there's a, there's a CRM that Microsoft's put out there that they tout as completely uh, uh, customizable. And I'm like, yeah, but you're selling it to people that haven't even determined what their funnel or their deal stages are. So customizable means nothing. It's just, you know, it's a glorified address book. Um, that's kind of what I do. I, I'll look at it and say, okay, your CRM is based on what your, you know, what your your entire kind of revenue uh, goals, how you're going about it, what your what your cultural makeup is, but also like you know what what you need to accomplish within each of those steps will really determine. I mean, a lot of CRMs I find that are free, you get what you pay for. It's just a glorified address book, right? Don't even bother. Um, you know, a CRM should not be just a place that you keep information that you hope you should go after sometime. You're 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 building out understanding and 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 you know everything from project planning, what a future might look like with that customer, to you know what are their here and now issues, and it's not just documentation for someone else to pick up or to remind you later. It's so that you can start to use other tools to feed in what 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 am I going to build here? I'm building this with this person. It's not just they're my customer and I'm selling them stuff. Um, so cool. that's why. Well, thanks for sharing that, Sam. My last question is mentors. You know, through your agency journey and also um, just your your business journey, who are some of the mentors that influenced you? And it, it doesn't have to be. Personal mentors, it could be like a book or another resource that has been a distant mentor to you. Sure. Um, there's a uh, there's a book called Made to Switch, uh, or sorry, there's a, a book called Switch that always stuck with me. Um, and was that a Chip and Dan Heath book? I can't remember. It is. It is. Okay, yeah. yeah, I love yeah. their stuff. Yeah, they have several books that are phenomenal. They do. It's made it, to one. stick was one. Um, yeah. Switch was one. Yeah. Switch really stuck with me. Like made to stick. It was kind of you know I I love the kind of the you know the upheaval on the brand pieces and what have you. But the switch stuck with me because I found it was one of those business books that didn't rely entirely on someone's current success or a bunch of recency bias to to say that the philosophy was true. Um, and it stuck with me because it 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 may change something to celebrate as opposed to fear. Um, and anyone that I run into that is, you know, obviously I bring them a whole bunch of stuff they haven't thought about before, or maybe they have thought about, but they're like, Whoa, that's all scary. I usually leave them with, if you got the time, read the thing, you know, it makes it so approachable and easy to, to look at. I mean, mentors throughout the years on personal level, I've learned, I, I've got a weird way about this. And I know it's because I'm like the business artist and not the business scientist, but most of my, um, most of my mentors are not people that you would look at and say, oh, they're, they're rank and file above him. I actually look at people that are either on, you know, we're equal in our experience or they're 
they have less experience than I do. That's where I pull a lot of my motivation and a lot of my understanding and influence on what's next. What can we get excited about? Um, you know, I've got, I've got things that have stuck with me like everybody else has, you know, uh, I was coaching someone today and heard myself saying, although I, it was so long ago, I couldn't attribute to who it came from, but I know it came from likely one of my, uh, you know, uh, strategists at the agency level who basically said, you know, as long as you're working on things, the one thing you will never run out of is opportunity. So stop grieving the one you think you missed. I love um, it. And those are, yeah, yeah, those are just things that that have stuck with me. And I think if you were to talk to my staff or anybody that that I've coached through the years, they'll tell you that I'm the I'm the I'm the guy of little anecdotal story, little anecdotal stories that'll capture your 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 attention for a second and you know maybe they're using some of my phrases out there living off them too so i love it well sam i want to be the first one to thank you everyone check out go to the well.ca to learn more and uh check out more episodes of the podcast and sammy thanks so much i really thanks appreciate everyone. it it's a lot of fun what i got you can't buy it resides between my eyes walk through the fire came out Just you find the same right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand